Good afternoon. Um, good morning from, from the States. I thank you for the opportunity to share with you this, this day and uh, <clears throat> look forward to the hopefully a lively conversation um, at the end of the, of the presentation. Um, you will have access to the slides both as a part of the recording and um, on the WWP website um, um, after today. And uh, so hopefully this information will be helpful. Um, and then as, as we were talking in setting up today, one of the things that if we, if there are more questions than we have time to while I'm still online, um, I will stay online and answer those that will be part of the recording so that you will have access to those questions and answers after, after today, um, if you have to leave off um, directly after an hour of our presentation. So um, just a quick uh, appreciation, the, the content that I'm gonna be sharing is based primarily on two chapters that I co-wrote in this book, Perpetrators of Intimate Partner Sexual Violence, which came out in 2018. Um, I wrote a chapter, the, the, the most of the content that I'll be sharing today is part of a chapter that I co-wrote with Lundy Bancraft on addressing and combating intimate partner sexual violence. Although I will be including some content um, based on the chapter that I wrote with uh, Walter, co-wrote, excuse me, with Walter de Kessidry on um, men's use of, men who perpetrate sexual violence use of pornography. It's a very wonky title, but there you have it. So um, to begin, um, I think it's important to spend a couple of minutes talking about the particular complexities of understanding and unpacking sexual violence in the context of intimate partner relationships and intimate partner violence. Um, the complications of um, the relationship status, um, what women's consent means, what access women have to consent, what men's entitlement means, get compounded and, and nuanced in those kinds of relationships in ways that they don't in, in typical stranger relationships. Um, it's, it's, it's an area that we're still unpacking and starting to understand more. Um, and which is part of the reason why it's it's really critical for practitioners such as yourself yourselves to start screening and helping us with your practice knowledge understand what do these dynamics look like what does men's entitlement how does it how does it present itself in terms of their expectations around sexual access to their partner's bodies um, how does that get unveiled in in intimate partner relationships and in relationships relationships where the abusive partner is using dynamics of, of coercive control. Um, oftentimes, as you all well know, men's entitlement in intimate, intimate relationships in general, and in particular in men who perpetrate violence, men's entitlement is not clear even to themselves. It's not conscious, um, which adds to the confusion, adds to this complexity. Um, and I really, you all well know the complexity of intimate partner violence already. And, and I assume given your, your experience and your practice, um, have some comfort, comfort and experience of leaning into the complexity. Um, and I really encourage you to do that as well in terms of the, the content of sexual violence. Now, what I'm gonna be sharing with you is a whole lot of content around how to screen for sexualized violence, men's perpetration of sexual violence. Um, I understand that most of you already have very packed, very complex screening and assessment processes that you already engage in. Um, so I trust you to kind of integrate this in a way that makes sense for you all. Um, I also understand the screening process or the assessment process to be part of the initial intake process and an ongoing process. Um, as, I, as many of you already know, I do, do not currently practice with with men who perpetrate violence but when I did um, you never stop assessment assessing was my experience you never stop screening um, you may have a period initially where you do the 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 main screening main assessment but throughout the process of the relationship either individual or in groups I was always assessing the person and assessing what they were what they were doing um, and would periodically through the intervention process add another kind of layer of assessment or screening in terms of um, better understanding and better supporting that person to be accountable and to make amends. And so I encourage you to, as I unpack this, to keep that in mind that this is not, I do not expect you to front load your screening process and, and integrate all of this in the intake process. Um, I do ask that you consider how can you integrate this in your intervention, um, both groups and individual. Um, 
Now, par pardon me, going back to the access issue and complexity issue, um, one of the part of the complexity is, is women's self expressed, self, self defined responsibilities to grant sexual access in marriage. Um, and his, the part, her, her partner's um, expectations about her responsibilities. Um, this is most women, it appears, at least in the research I've seen in the US context, assume some sense of responsibility to, if they're entering a relationship, a long-term relationship, then she's agreeing to some, some degree of access to her body. Um, the, in the US context, there appears to be some dis difference between men's ex expectations of how much access he has the right to once they've entered a, a intimate relationship and what she understands. And so for you all in your work, starting to assess that um, is a part, starts, starts the screening process. So that's some of the other dynamics around this, this um, area of women's responsibilities to granting sexual access to her male partner is that it, is that it is exclusive to him, that it is generally under his control, um, particularly in the context of intimate partner violence, the, the sexual relationship, the sexual contact is primarily for his pleasure. Um, her pleasure would be secondary. And in, in terms of uh, intimate partner sexual violence, um, there's limited recor recourse for her if she doesn't share this expectations of these responsibilities. In terms of men's um, entitlement or men's quote unquote rights um, within a sexual relationship, they often, and this again in the US context, um, goes beyond just intimate partner sexual violence, but is throughout the relation, throughout intimate partnerships, um, that they men have the right to sex with her um, when they want, in the ways that we want, I should say we, because I'm a man too, um, and that, that she enjoys the sex that we're having um, with them. Um, as you all know, all of these expectations and senses of entitlement tend to be ramped up or exaggerated for men who are using coercive control dynamics. And so this right here starts the beginning of the assessment process is starting to unpack what does he believe he has the right to in terms of um, sexual relationships with his partner. Okay, so in terms of sexual violence, there are several ways that that tends to be expressed. Um, firstly is, is forcing sex within the intimate partner relationship. Um, but in addition, in some of the ways that it is particularly gets played out in intimate partner abuse relationships is demanding sex after an assault, um, often referred to as makeup sex, um, viewing pornography and then forcing their partner to do, to engage in behaviors of how, of what they've seen in the pornography, also forcing her to watch pornography and then um, engage in the behaviors that they see in pornography, um, demeaning her, appearance or performance, uh, the way she looks, the way she acts while having sex, why is she not enjoying it as much as he thinks he should, she should, excuse me, um, having outside sexual relationships and making sure that she knows about it, and also demanding that she have sex with other people. Um, all of these are forms of sexual assault within an intimate partner relationship. All of these are relatively common. Um, from what little we know, they appear to be relatively common in the dynamics of intimate partner violence. And so all of these need to be part of the understanding of sexual violence and therefore screened for in terms of your work with, uh, with men who perpetrate. Um, in order for them to make amends, to be accountable and make amends, they need to at least begin to identify all of the expressions of their violence and control and how that gets expressed. Oops, sorry. That was a duplicated some here. Okay. All right. So, core questions that I think are important to explore throughout your relationship with uh, with working with men who batter or men who are abusive is is exploring with him his understanding of uh, how does he allow her to say no. How does he allow her to negotiate when he expects or demands sexual relationships? Um, what options does she have in, in that regard? Um, my experience is that men tend to exaggerate their sense of the, the, the degree to which they allow, quote unquote, some 
negotiation on her part. So it's important to understand that from his point of view, but then also have that tracked in terms of what is she, what is her experience of him allowing her to negotiate and and uh, and her opportunities to say no. Um, and kind of within that is exploring how does how does he allow her to express her her sexual desires and her sexual wishes. Again, um, my experience is that typically they exaggerate how much they do this. Um, and so un hearing that, hearing his, the, the ways that he, he displays, the way um, his answer to this question um, with a little bit of a, of a wanting more information. And so tracking that as you go through the process to, to really unpack what that means for him in terms of allowing her agency within the relationship. General screening questions um, under the kind of theme of how, how can one say yes if they can't say no. Um, at exploring with him, when does he ask for sex? On what are the, circ what are the circumstances that he expects or wants sex with her? Um, is there some kind of pattern? And there often is. Is there some kind of pattern to when he wants sex, when he wants sex more than other times? Um, what, what, what's going on with that? And then tracking that pattern, if there is one, tracking that pattern with the pattern of other forms of violence, other expressions of coercive control. Um, how, do, how does he ask for sex? Do they ask at all? Or is it just something that they do? Uh, what, is, what, is their, um, what is the process of asking her for sex? Is it a, is it a question? Is it, an, is, it true, is it a true ask? Or is it a demand under the guise of a question? Um, again, what are the opportunities for her to say no if she doesn't des desire to have sex with him at that moment? What are the opportunities for her to change her mind? I, I think it's not uncommon for people in intimate relationships to both think that they do want to have sex and then change their mind and realize that they really don't, or think that they don't want to have sex and then change their mind and realize that they do, in fact want to engage in sexual activity. Well, how does he allow for that within their sexual relationship? What is his reaction when she says no or when she changes her mind? Not just in terms of the, the reaction of violence or abusiveness, but also other kinds of um, patterns of behavior that, that have some either elements of coercive control or um, emotional manipulation, pouting, withdrawal, quote unquote, negotiating, um, what what does that look like? Helping him explore that I find to be really powerful and particularly in a group dynamic and group contexts where they're hearing from each other what their dynamics are around negotiating, asking, pleading, begging, whatever the, the, the verb is, um, their expectations for, for sexual relationships with their partner. I would, in terms of the expressions that I mentioned earlier, I think some of the screening questions, some of the screening points to look at are what is the role of sex within their domestic, their perpetration of domestic violence? Is it a part of the violent episode? Is it um, part of quote unquote makeup sex as I referred to earlier? Is it a, an excuse that he uses to escalate his violence or perpetrate a, a violent episode? Is there a role, and there often is, is there a role for the sex within their domestic violence dynamics and patterns, and what is that role? What is the role of sex? Once that is understood, then we can unpack what are the expectations, what is, what is the privilege, what are the entitlements attached to the, the sex and the role of that place in the, in the perpetration of the violence. Um, other, otherwise, assessing for his pornography use, um, assessing how they view their partner and her sexuality and her behavior, and then assessing for, as I mentioned earlier, assessing for his, any extramarital relationships. In terms of a screening for pornography use, this is, this is a whole area in and of itself that's, that's um, worth screening and exploring um, in, in large part to understand how, what is his experience of using pornography and how does that in, inform his experience and of using course of control in the relationship. Um, you will note that these questions are based on the assumption that he does use pornography. Um, the, liter the literature that I've seen, particularly the literature of, um, from Walter de Kessetry, um, suggests that 
men who perpetrate intimate partner violence have a higher rate of pornography use than the men in the general audience, in the general population. And so I think it's a safe assumption that men who perpetrate intimate partner violence, the men who are in your groups or in your programs are using pornography. And so unpacking that to understand what does that mean for him and how does that play into his perpetration of violence, perpetration of coercive control is a critical factor. As many of you probably know or may know, um, I'm fairly critical of men's use of pornography broadly. I, I think that in general, men's use of pornography is problematic and harmful. Um, I'm not pushing that agenda at this moment. I think within the context of intimate partner sexual violence, men's use of pornography is proven to be problematic based on the literature that they see, that we've seen, based on the research that we've done. So um, regardless of your own personal view of pornography and pornography use, in terms of your work with men who perpetrate, understanding that pornog his pornography use is often a part of his coercive control dynamics, a part of it, the way that he justifies his abusiveness, um, and is often an active part of the abuse itself, that requires, I would argue, requires that you unpack that as a part of the, the abuse dynamics. So some of the questions you ask is how often does he view pornography? What types of pornography does he tend to use? Um, what is his understanding of her thoughts, feelings, or reactions to his pornography use? What, one of the sub pieces underneath that is assessing for to what degree does he hide from her um, his pornography use? And to what degree does he account for her reactions when he's viewing pornography? So does he does he know that she doesn't like it and does and does he look at it anyway? Um, does he know that she doesn't like it and so hide his pornography use? What does that look like in terms of how he looks at pornography um, in the context of her his understanding of her reactions? Uh, looking at when he uses pornography. Again, um, what is the relationship of his pornography use to not only his abusive outbursts, his violent episodes? but also more broadly in the relationship as a whole. In general, what we are learning suggests that men who use pornography in the context of their intimate relationships, both use it on a fairly regular basis and tend to use it when they don't feel like their sexual rights are being satisfied. Um, and so understanding that piece reverts back to a, an overall view of his uh, understanding of his rights or his entitlement within the relationship as a whole. And then unpacking how does his viewing pornography impact on how he treats or interacts with her sexually. And this is where you, it, it's, it's helpful to unpack, uh, how, you know, his use of pornography, um, his use of pornography, and then expecting her to perform what he's seen or trying what he's seen in pornography with his partner, um, his use of forcing her or asking or encouraging whatever the verb he might use, her to watch pornography with him, how he judges her um, relative to the, 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 the actresses, for lack of a better word, the actresses in the pornography context. There is a whole lot even under that question that's, that is worthy of exploring in terms of, of how he is using pornography and how that impacts on their relationship and his treatment of her. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things that Lundy Bancroft and I explored was um, these five dynamics that in general, requires that men to have in order to perpetrate intimate partner sexual violence. This is specific to IPSV. Um, I think there's some, we can uh, extrapolate to other expressions of sexual assault and men's perpetration of sexual violence, but this is based on the literature that looks at how it is and why it is that men perpetrate intimate partner sexual violence. And so screening, a part of the screening process, a part of the assessment needs to look at each of these areas and ex exploring um, what each of these mean in terms of how does each of these get played out in the relationship. So in terms of, oops, in terms of developing, uh, assessing for lack of empathy, um, questions that I would ask, how do you experience her feelings? There's a lot of empathy screening tools. You probably already have some of them in your toolbox already, um, but some of the most specifically ones are, are you able to pick up on her moods? Um, kind of the, the general theme is looking at often, sometimes, or rarely, what's the pattern of your ability to pick up on her moods? What does it mean when you pick up on her moods? 
What is your reaction to her moves? How uncomfortable do you feel when she expresses her feelings to you? Um, what's your reaction when she expresses her feelings in general? And then asking again, under the empathy lens, how would he describe his ex her experience of being sexual with him? Um, look, always looking at kind of from the lens of, is he able to put himself in any way in her shoes and understand what it is that she's feeling and expressing? In terms of the envisioning dynamic, and by envisioning what I mean is that, that men who perpetrate intimate partner sexual violence need to have some idea in their head around what it is that they do, what, the, what it is that they perpetrate. So in sexual assault more broadly, this envisioning term is often referred to as grooming. Um, what we know is that most men who perpetrate sexual violence have a plan for the sexual violence that they're going to perpetrate, even those men who who are perpetrating it in, in acquaintance rape situations. They have a plan of how are they going to um, respond to her hesitancy or um, how are they going to respond to get her get her to, to participate. To use the slang that is fairly common, um, how does he get her no to a yes? That's a plan. Having that plan requires having a vision in his mind around what he wants to do and how he's going to get her to participate. So assessing for that is me include some of the things of um, how does he conceive of sex with his partner? What, what is his general ideas around having sex with her? What kinds of sex does he like? What kinds of sex does he expect with her? What kinds of um, response does he expect or require in terms of um, his having sex with her? When he starts to you know, put his moves on and get her in the mood, if you will. What is his assumptions or his expectations or his entitlement around how she's going to respond to his, his moves? Um, looking at specifically the kinds of sex that he likes and, and what are the elements of coercion or control or dominance that are part of his overall view of what sex looks like with her. Um, <clears throat> Again, as a part of his visioning, the, this envisioning theme, what is his react response when she has hesitant? Um, what's his plan for addressing or responding when she decides to say no or when she doesn't want to do a specific act that he is asking her to do? Um, asking when he uses force and what does the, that look like? What are situations that lend him to justify um, ignoring her no or ignoring her hesitance? hesitancy in order to force the, the sexual act that he's decided he wants to do. All of that kind of falls under the theme of, of how did he get to a vision of the sex that he wants to engage with her and what's the element of force or control as a part of that visioning. Assessing for social approval requires for, uh, for you all to go to not only look at his assess or his um, understanding of or, or belief, experience, that's the word I'm looking for, his experience of social approval, but also for you to go outside of the, the realm of the relationship and look at what is the actual support or approval that he gets from his peers and from his friend network. Um, so this is largely based on the uh, theoretical model of uh, male peer support, which was developed by Martin Walter sorry, Walter de Kessendry and Martin Schwartz. And the basic notion of male peer support is that uh, what they found in, in over 15 years of research is that most men who perpetrate violence um, have a peer social network that supports their beliefs and their attitudes. These men may not necessarily support the actual violence, but their peer networks does support the attitudes and beliefs that underlie the expressions of violence. So the, the idea of of traditional masculinity, the idea of male dominance in a relationship, the idea that men have the right to get angry when when she says no for, to sex. All of the, that peer network is really powerful in, in granting him the approval, the sense of, and granting his sense of entitlement and that sense of approval to be able to do what he's doing. So part of your assessment is unpacking to what degree does this sense of a, what, to what degree is there, does he have a sense of social support amongst his peer network? And to what degree does that sense of social support actually exist? 
So in terms of his experience of this, this sense of social approval amongst his peer network, how does he share his sexual experiences with his friends? What does he talk about with them? What does he share with them? What is his experience of their response to him, uh, to what he shares? Um, so, you know, when he's talking about how often he has a set, he has sex um, with his peer network um, over beer or at the bowling alley or whatever, um, what does he experience as their reaction to him? Do they ever push back? Does he ever hear from his peer network from his perspective? Does he ever hear from his from his peer network? You know, maybe you went too far there or maybe that's not OK. Um, and then what is his response to those pushbacks? How do they support him to experience empathy with her, if at all? Again, some of these questions are part of your assessment in terms of his experience. I really encourage you to also go outside of that and ask these questions of his social network yourself. Find out from them, how do they, how do they feel about how he treats his wife or his girlfriend, his partner, if you will. Um, what, what, how do they um, relate to his stories of um, it, uh, interacting with her, of having, of having sex with her. Um, do they ever feel uncomfortable with what he has shared with them? And how do they express this discomfort? Do they ever disagree with him about how he relates to his partner? That I would argue that's part of, that should be part of the assessment in general. But in terms of intimate partner's sexual violence and his sexual relations with his expectations and, and relationships with his partner, it is particularly critical because the, the research is suggesting that this, this notion of, of male peer support network is particularly uh, virulent in terms of the, the perpetration of sexual violence within the intimate relationship. Um, in terms of assessing for the sanctions that he experienced, um, this includes both the legal sanctions and the formal sanctions, but also, and in my mind, more um, impactfully, what is his experience of the sanctions amongst his, his, his peer network, amongst the people that he knows, um, and what is their reaction? So part of the, the, the sanctions are looking at um, how, in general, there's this confusion between seduction and coercion, and what kind of sanctions has he experienced for crossing that line, for conf confusing um, seduction and coercion, what, what, is, what are the sanctions he experiences when, or what is the, I need to use another word other than sanctions, what is the push, pushback that he experiences when he shares stories of how he gets his partner to participate and it's really clear to his network, to his friends, to others that he's crossed the line and that wasn't a seduction moment, that was coercion, those were coercive tactics. Um, what is their reaction to him around that and um, what's his experience of that? Um, in general, what is what is other people's reactions to their experience of him having gone too far in any of these elements? The right to have sex, the force means try again, or that no means try again, or that assault in general is not is not really violent. Um, he likely experiences some of these. Um, he may not pay attention to them because they're either too small or too insignificant to raised to the bar, or he has enough counter narrative, counter stories of support for engaging his behavior that it's able to, to um, overwhelm any sanctions that he experiences. But assessing for that is, 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 is critically important in part because it helps to expose a degree of uh, confusion in him around what is he doing. Um, part of my experience uh, and expectation of working with, with men who have perpetrated violence is that there's a part of him who understands that what they are doing is not okay. And that is in conflict with the part of him that is justifying what he's doing. And in part, I think as I've mentioned before, um, a, a part of the dynamic of minimizing and denial is in fact that that aspect of him that knows that this is not acceptable and I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing and and I'm really hurting somebody that I really care about and 
there's a problem with that. That's what reinforces that shame is part of what, what fuels the minimizing and the denial. Sanctions also, his experience of those sanctions also reinforce that sense of shame about what he's doing, that sense of guilt, that sense of, I'm not, this really isn't okay. And, and I, I have trouble to explaining or justifying what it is that I know I'm doing. And so unpacking those sanctions help, it helps expose that rift. And that rift is the lane where you all are working, um, trying to get that, that part of him that understands that he's not, that this isn't okay to hold that part of him that's justifying his behavior to account. And so assessing for sanctions is a, is a part of that dynamic. Now that's the end of the content that I have. I uh, appear to be a little bit early, which is great. So we have more time for questions and dialogue. Um, if there's content that more information or more content that you want, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to, to dialogue with you um, further. So. Hi, I'm, I'm back Hi. to support you in the Q&A. We actually haven't received any questions from participants yet. So I figured okay. uh, I'll, I'll type while I ask you because I actually have a couple of uh, questions. Um, typing and talking, not that easy. Um, so my, <laughs> question, <laughs> my question to you is, um, in your experience, um, what are good topics to use as segues into talking about sex and sexualized violence? <laughs> Well, that's a really good question, and, and I'm probably not um, the best with that. I'm not particularly good at segues. Um, <laughs> I, I have a list of things that I feel like we need to address, and part of the relationship building is, for me, is both in individual and group context, is, um, this is this is content that we have to address, and so um, we need to address it. I will say that because of... Um, at least in the US context, because of how we tend to pack sex and sexuality so much with embarrassment and shame and humiliation. Um, this is typically later in the process for me. Um, I think it's important to have a relationship with uh, the men that I'm working with, um, or I should say the men that I worked with um, before getting into a topic which is typically, which, which typically makes men more significantly more uncomfortable than a lot of the other content. Um, but um, but I, I just kind of added to the agenda. Um, one of the segues, one of the activities that I typically use is called, is an activity that, that looks at what's the degree of harm of particular behaviors. And so the, the activity is um, to kind of put on the wall this notion of on, the, on one side, um, least least harmful on the other most harmful spread that across on a continuum in the room and then ha describe some behaviors and um, have the men place themselves physically on that continuum of the degree to which they believe that activity or that behavior is harmful mm -hmm. um, i use that activity fairly often or i used that activity fairly often in the process of the group um, because i find it it's very powerful and it helps unpack some of the dynamics that we're talking about and and it helps expose um the conflict that men have around justifying and and uh, excusing their behavior on the, on the one hand and understanding that that there is harm to this on the other so as a part of laying out um these different act behaviors that are to, are to to some degree harmful i include sexualized violence within that that activity um, as a way to start opening up that that conversation. So as an example, um, one question might be in that activity, um, getting angry and punching the wall um, on the opposite side of her. To what degree is that harmful? Getting angry and punching the wall next to her head. Um, having uh, viewing pornography without her consent, knowing that she she doesn't like it when I use pornography. Um, those are some of the examples of, of ways that you can kind of start to segue and open up this conversation within the broader context of. of so using really specific behaviors. 
like yes. really specific uh, examples. Okay. In that continuum activity, yes, very specific behaviors. We actually have some questions coming in, which I'd love to share with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one, which is, uh, in your experience, do men realize the line between seduction and coercion, or are they too entitled to understand that there is a difference? I think in general, I think in general, men know that there is a line somewhere, but are not very clear of that. And that is true with men in general. And it is particularly true with men who have perpetrate, who are perpetrating intimate partner violence. Um, I think there is a lot of entitlement um, in, tied into this, the blurring of the lines. But I also think it's, it's a lot of how mainstream, how in the mainstream we talk about seduction. Um, I would uh, suggest that if you watch most movies, listen to most music, read most books, um, what they define as seductive tactics are actually coercion. And at least in terms of how men, how men engage in getting their partner to engage in sex. Um, so that line, that line is very blurry in the broader context. Um, it is even more blurry in the context of an intimate partner violence in part because of this, this sense of entitlement that you reference. Okay. We actually we have a question with a follow-up comment. So I'm just going to put the follow-up comment first and then the question. <laughs> okay. So um, one more thing. In Romania, sexual violence seems cool and the survivors are the ones to blame for it. So what can you say when men respond with every man I know rapes his wife, all of my friends are rough while during sex with their wives, etc. So if, if you work in a context where sexual violence is so normalized, more so than maybe even in other contexts. This is a good one, and, I, and this is a very good one. Thank you for asking. It, it, it's, it's making me reflect on the experiences here in the U.S. and the, the degree to which sexual violence likewise to, is, is framed as cool and, and, uh, and yes, that the survivors are to blame. I think in general, with a lot of with a lot of these kinds of norms, there are often competing norms that exist. And so yes, this may be a norm in some that, that gets expressed in some ways in Romania, but I suspect that there is a an, ad, another norm that is more about sexual sexual relationship, sexual equality within sexual relationships, and that sexual violence is not okay. And that um, using being rough is not okay. Um, I think this is a really great opportunity to to use this kind these kinds of examples in the continuum of harm activity, because what I suspect will, if you get more specific than, than, than rough while doing sex, what does that really look like? It's okay to slap my wife um, or my girlfriend while having sex. It's okay to slap her in the face. It's okay to slap her with my fist. It's okay to use a weapon. What you will typically find is that as men place themselves on that continuum, they actually place themselves on a continuum. And some men will say that, will argue that that's least harmful, and some men will argue that it's more harmful. That dialogue exposes these competing norms. That, yes, this, there is this norm that exists that I use to justify um, hitting my wife in the face when I have sex with her, but, the, but that same, but a, 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 another person situated in the same way would argue that that's not the norm, that it is not okay to do that to my partner in the case of a, having a sexual relationship. And so again, I think that continuum of, of harm is a really good activity to unpack, uh, unpack the, the competing norms. Um, and, then, and then encourage them to have the dialogue around, around um, what to do with that the, the idea that these, these two competing norms are being exposed. Um, one of the things that's really critical around the, the continuum of harm activity is that none of them, no one is saying that these behaviors are not harmful. The continuum is least harmful to most harmful, which indicates by definition that everything we're talking about is harmful. Hitting your partner while having sex is harmful. Um, if you want to argue that in, in the group, then that's a different conversation. But for the purposes of the activity, the assumption is all of these behaviors are to some degree harmful. 
and that that lay that starts to lay a norm and even that statement in response to, to your comment here, even that statement starts to unpack the way that these there are competing norms that exist in, in Romania and everywhere else around men's use of violence within sex. I hope that that was so, sort of kind of an answer and not an evasion. <laughs> I, I feel like you answered the stuff for me. So <laughs> I was a bit confused at the, at the beginning, but I my confusion was resolved. Um, so there's actually another question from Simona which is, um, you might not be able to, to answer this question from a woman's perspective, but maybe from your experience <laughs> anyway. Um, so how can you make men accountable for sexual violence without them feeling judged, especially when you're a woman and they don't feel comfortable talking about this with you? In terms of the first part of that question, um, I don't know. And I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing, especially early in the process, to feel judged, to be judged in terms of my, in terms of us holding men accountable or supporting men to be accountable. I, I, I think it's, I think it's a fairly natural response, particularly in those contexts like in the U.S. where we have, where being accountable has such a punitive kind of criminal legal uh, framework, right? In, in the US, when you talk about holding people accountable, most people's gut reaction is to a, an experience of being punished um, in, in some way. And so there is kind of built in. Um, I think it takes some work with people to start unpacking that, that being accountable isn't and, and punishment are two very different things. There may be an element of punishment that is a part of accountability but they're actually, they're actually completely separate. Um, for men who have perpetrated sexual violence and intimate partner violence, again, there is a part of them, I believe there is a part of them that is already judging themselves. That's where the shame, in my mind, that's where the shame, that's where the minimizing, that's where the denial comes from. They're already judging that this, it's not okay for them to do what they're doing. Being held accountable by an outside force reinforces that judgment that they're that they're laying on themselves and that's not necessarily a bad thing maybe they do maybe they do need to go through an experience of judging themselves and judging themselves harshly to come to terms with the fact that they have hurt somebody that they claim to love and maybe a part of that process starts with being feeling judged by somebody else um, I understand underneath the question that you don't want to come across as judgy um, that you don't want to that you don't want to damage that relationship by being judgmental or or, or um, blaming or shaming within the context, and I think that's part of the in my experience that's part of the therapeutic or the or the relationship building is to talk about how yes you are holding the line and you are holding a firm line, and judging their behavior, and not judging them as human beings, which starts to give them an ability to. to recognize how they can also judge their behavior without necessarily judging themselves as human beings. As far as your, your position as a woman, um, again, I, I guess my, again, my, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the premise in terms of, is it necessarily bad for men to feel uncomfortable? in having a, a hard, direct, open conversation with a woman like this. Um, I think feeling uncomfortable is a part of the dynamic. And rather than trying to um, ease men's ability, ease into, and rather than trying to make men feel more comfortable, I think it, it may be more beneficial to support men to feel uncomfortable in these moments. It's, it's okay to feel not okay. And maybe part of the process of coming to terms with hurting people that I love means coming to, coming to a place where I can be okay with feeling really not okay with myself. Maybe that's more of the work than helping them not feel like they're being judged. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I would actually have one more question for you, which is, um, 
if there is one thing that you want participants to take home today from this webinar, what would you say is that? I'd be really interested. Just the clip notes version. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think the one thing that would be that the growing evidence is that as I look at the evidence, is that sexualized violence is a, an inherent part of intimate partner violence. Mm. Um, and um, that's, it's, it's, it's enough, there's enough evidence for me to start making that as an assumption. Um, and so how do we do a better job of integrating, assessing for the sexual violence aspects of, that are inherent in intimate partner violence? And, and and holding him to account for that as a part of um, holding him to account for the broader dynamics of domestic violence. So um, looking at the, the one thing that I would ask for you all to take take with you is, is how can you, is looking at how to integrate within your practice and your processes and within your work within the context of your community efforts to hold men accountable. Um, what does sexual violence look like? And on the pro-social side, um, what does sexual equality look like within intimate relationships? And how do we you know, move men from who have perpetrated domestic violence or intimate partner violence, how do we move them from these dynamics of, of coercive control to, to coercive of sexual respect and sexual equality within their relationships? So I guess that's two things.